Following this event, you'll be able to find a link to the recording of this talk on our website by the end of the day. With that said, I'll introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Steve Sin is the Director of the Unconventional Weapons and Technology Division at START, where he manages large research projects, explores new avenues for research, and establishes collaborative research relationships. Steve, you can go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, Erin. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, so Erin uh, approached me and uh, asked me if I could do a, a, a talk on uh, information warfare. Um, and so in trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about today, I, uh, I thought, and, and this th talk is also, a lot of it is for uh, our interns as well, uh, intern students as well. So I thought we were going to uh, talk a little bit in generalities about what information warfare is, what, have, what the purpose of the information warfare is, and how people have been using it, and give some past um, examples of uh, how these things have been used, and some implications. Uh, and uh, my goal is um, perhaps not to give you any new information that you may not have known before, uh, but the, really the goal is to start a conversation, um, you know, uh, basically provoke uh, your thought processes and uh, see what where our discussion can lead. Uh, so the talk itself, uh, I'm aiming uh, not to be longer than uh, 30 minutes. I'm hoping that it will be shorter than 30 minutes uh, that I actually talk and then I uh, will do questions and discussions from the audience uh, that uh, Aaron will moderate um, skillfully. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and uh, have a few slides uh, to, to talk through. And then we'll go from there. All right, so this works. So first, I wanted to start with, uh, and I wanted to start with <clears throat> a few um, definitions of information warfare. And these are not the information warfare definition that the US military uses. The US military uses a somewhat different one, um, a very very much when you say information warfare in the US military, very much uh, keyed in on the destruction, dis disruption, denial of information and gaining advantage through the information environment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it does not, one of the things that I find that the US military definition to be a little bit lacking is by simply looking at it, a lot of people don't necessarily get what is this exactly in terms of what, what does the information warfare mean? Um, so I found two that is a little bit more uh, in the layman's term, if, I, if you will. Um, the first one, you know, coherent and synchronized blending of physical and virtual actions. And I think that's actually what spoke to me about this first uh, definition that I have here. It is physical and at virtual. Uh, today we talk about information warfare uh, very much closely with uh, cyber events uh, and that is because cyber happens to be a very good medium to do information warfare um, so a lot of it is virtual uh, and we sometimes forget about the fact that um, a lot of these activities have become were and will be in the in the physical realm and then manifests itself uh, in the physical world not just in the virtual world and the other part of that first uh, definition that we have here uh, that I really liked is the fact that it talks about, you know, it is trying to make the other side, uh, your competitors or what have you, uh, to take an action or not to perform an action. So I think that is at the crux of what information warfare or the anything that you do in the information environment. Um, you can, you can call it disinformation campaigns, you can call it influence campaigns. Uh, today we have things like misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, um, active measures, all these terms that are flying around. At the end of the day, what we are really talking about is what can we do to, or what is other people doing to us to make us do things or not do things uh, that is not necessarily at our will. Now that is, I think, is the most important one. And I have the Russian military's, um, their usage of what the information warfare is. And it kind of speaks to what I was talking about in terms of cyber being really a medium, right? Um, it's a holistic concept that includes computer operations, 
computer network operations, electronic warfare, psychological operations, information operations. So it is not a, not something, when we say information warfare, and I think um, Aaron uh, asked me to talk about information warfare specifically, not necessarily as a misinformation or disinformation. And I think what she also had in mind is this, is when we want to talk about information uh, we don't necessarily have to call it warfare, but we want to talk about this type of information operations or information environment as a whole, right? Um, as a whole in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, computer network operations or your cyber disinformation campaign may not be by itself. It, it could be for a part of something else, right? And we need to look at it as a holistically as possible and to figure out what the adversaries are doing. See, and all all good briefings or all good presentation needs to start with a sort of a quote, right? But I will have this, these kind of quotes sort of interspersed throughout our uh, throughout our talk today. And the first one, and, and they're all from Sun Tzu. Um, and um, and actually, this uh, this particular uh, lecture um, made me go back to my uh, Art of War book uh, that I have not used since um, since I was in undergrad but so I thumbed through it and and I think this first one actually really talks about what the first uh, what we when we think about information warfare and what, what comes to our mind right is you know it says when you are going to attack nearby make it look you are going a long way when you are going to attack far away make it look like you're going a short distance essentially what he's talking about really is deception, right? You, you deceive your enemies. So what you see on this slide is are a bunch of what we call dummy tanks from World War II. On the left is the British cruisers um, that was, uh, that was used in the Northern Africa uh, during World War II. And on the right is uh, a Sherman tank, a blow-up Sherman tank uh, that was used in the Western Europe uh, front. And we actually had a, uh, and Connor uh, just uh, just chatted, uh, Ghost Army, and that is so true. So the, the picture on the right is from the Ghost Army. We actually had about 1,100 people um, that is dedicated to do dece deception operations throughout Europe where they would go to different places, uh, mimic convoys, uh, mimic headquarters elements, um, complete with not just blow up tanks and transport vehicles, but also with things like sound, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the entire idea was to, dis to make the Germans uh, believe we, we were one at one place when we actually were not, right? So the deception, um, the art of deception, uh, military has used for a long time and to this day uh, that's what we want to do is uh, we deceive the enemy to look one way or think that we're doing one thing while we're doing actually something else and if you really think about the information environment or if you think back if you think about the incidents that are occurring today um, whether that be COVID-19 disinformation uh, election um, election in interferences, what have you, uh, to even the protests, right? Uh, interference in, in the protests itself, et cetera, et cetera. If you think about what we are, what we are experiencing today, you will probably see a lot of this deception uh, in that as part of the repertoire that our adversary or whoever is doing the uh, information operation is using. The next one is, you know, cause division among them. So one of the things that the information operations does and uh, it's aimed to do is to divide us, right? Uh, it, it is much easier to conquer a divided enemy than the uh, united enemy, as we know. And yes, I'm using a lot of military terms here. Um, and partly because if you're thinking about a, our state-sponsored uh, information 
uh, warfare or disinformation campaign, or as we now call influence campaigns, um, if you think about the state-sponsored ones, uh, our adversaries look at this as warfare, right? We, as Americans, don't necessarily think of these things as warfare, uh, and there's a academic debate about, and even in the military and in academia about, you know, when do we consider something warfare versus not, um, whereas our adversaries are always engaged in warfare uh, against their, their adversaries, uh, us being one of them. And, and they think of it in those terms. They think of it as we need to divide and conquer our enemies or adversaries. And that's how they think about these things. And um, so the next one is, so the next, another aim of information warfare obviously is to cause um, division amongst the, uh, amongst the enemy. So one of the things that we have here, actually, uh, you can read the slides, but so in the 50s, we had a case where the Soviet Union, uh, along with uh, North Korea and China, accused the United States of using biological warfare uh, in, during Korean War. And this came out in 1951, so Korean War was actually happening. Um, the picture that you see on the slide is a, are dead flies uh, that Chinese scientists have captured in the uh, test tube. And supposedly uh, that the flies were dead because they, uh, they were exposed to the biological agents uh, that the U.S. had had used in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, extensively on, on the Chinese border and in North, North Korea, what is North Korea today. And obviously this was false. The United States have um, protested uh, against these kind of uh, disinformation campaign back then, uh, even to the UN, et cetera, et cetera, uh, requested the UN to conduct independent inquiries into the matter um, and all the, the entire international system wanted, uh, you know, try to get the entire international system to independently verify that this was either a false or true news. The United States position obviously was this was a false news. Um, and the China and North Korea refused to let the uh, international inspectors in. But the interesting thing was that this particular um, story or this particular event uh, caught on in Europe. Uh, and uh, a lot of the people thought we were using uh, biological warfare in North Korea. And we had um, demonstrations against U.S. embassies uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, people were demonstrating in, the, in their capitals about the brutal use of, you know, biological agents uh, by the United States on war, on people, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, Picasso even painted a mural uh, displaying that we were spreading germs uh, during the Korean War. So it, it, took, it took hold on people. And the, the idea here really was to divide the allies, right? The, the, to discredit the United States and divide our allies from us, you know, make them think twice about supporting the United States in this war effort. Uh, because during the Korean War, as you all know very well, we had a UN force of multinational forces that are involved uh, in the Korean War on the side of the South Korean to assist the South Koreans. And the idea from the Soviet Union was, you know, what do I, what can I do to fracture that alliance? You know, make the governments not be shy about, make the governments be shy about joining the United States because their people are against the United States. And this actually went on, the, um, this biological uh, weapons scheme actually went on until about the first part of the 60s. Uh, I think, um, if I remember correctly, the Soviet Union ended the campaign in 1961. Um, so it went on for 10 years. And, and so during that 10 years, people actually believed that this was going on. Um, and what we also see here is the, is, the importance of normal people, um, normal people meaning that are not part of the institution that is actually pumping out uh, this information campaign. Um, so, and this happens today as well, right? The, uh, what you can see is 
the news or the accusation of U.S. using biological weapons gets out, and all you have to do is sow that seed into the people, and people, knowingly or unknowingly, will transmit this information to each other. Now, transmission itself is knowingly. However, a lot of people don't know if this is false information. Uh, some people know it's false information, but they're transmitting anyway because that's what they're supposed to do. But most of the majority of the people will transmit the information without knowing that this is false information. And it gets to where you have the second bullet where you have millions of people protesting because they actually believe the information is true. Um, and, that, and that is actually the power of this information campaign. You know, information campaign, if you really think about it, is not about uh, what is the message. Uh, it is about, but it is really about how can I get people uh, that are not, that are outside of the information warfare machinery to propagate my message? You know, what is the message that I can send that I can use to propagate the message? That's the important part about this uh, entire idea. Uh, the other part also is in this case, and we also, I think this is a good time for me to talk, touch a little bit on about misinformation versus disinformation. And this obviously uh, was a clear case of disinformation campaign. Um, misinformation has to, misinformation is about turning an information that is actually true uh, and shining it in a, in a, in mischaracterizing it, uh, taking it out of context, or shining it in a, uh, in the wrong way, in a, in a wrong direction. That's misinformation. So the information itself, if you really think, think about it, the fact exists, and all you're doing with the misinformation campaign is, essentially, we used to call it spinning in the 90s, right? You actually spin the information uh, to your own advantage so that people see it the way you see it. That's misinformation. Disinformation is essentially nothing is true. The United States has never used biological weapons in North Korea. And so this entire premise that we used it is false. That's disinformation. But there's a key here. In order for disinformation to work really, really well, it has to there has to be some granular of truth in it. It doesn't have to be the truth that is specifically about the biological weapons in this case, but a lot of the people in Europe were believing the United States, it was credible information that the United States would use something like biological weapons in North Korea because of what we did in 1945. And most of you will probably remember, can probably guess what that is, right? The two nuclear weapons that we use on Japan, people know about it, people saw it, well, some people have seen it back then, and say, well, look, these are, this is a country that used nuclear weapons on another country. So what is it to them to use biological weapon? That was the logic that a lot of people uh, were using to give credibility to this story, right? And what's really interesting is the Soviets have never said something like that it, during their entire campaign. Soviets did not mention anything about, well, US is obviously doing this because you know, they, they used nuclear weapons before. They have never said it. But this was an Im, you know, this was a, a implicit thing that people just kind of picked up because of what our behavior was prior to this uh, disinformation campaign kicked off. And, that is also a key, you know, that is the key of how well disinformation campaigns can work. Um, and finally, uh, the final point that I want to do here is the use anger to throw them into disarray. And this is what, uh, what we see today a lot, right? Um, what do you do with that? Well, here we go. So, and this is a, uh, the picture on the right is actually a fake photo. Uh, we've, uh, people have identified that the person that is uh, raising that fist there is actually a white, uh, a white supremacist. Um, 
and posing to be an Antifa a person at a, a recent protest. And groups do this, right? Groups have figured out that fake photos like this, and we now have things called deep fake and things that, uh, that looks really real um, and are designed to manipulate our emotional responses and to get us angry, to get us to be, to get us riled up, if you will. And that gets you to act one way or another, right? If you, if you are white nationalist, you would act one way. If you are some, some people in the middle, you, will wait, you might act another. If you are a, a Black Lives Matter activist, you may act another way. So essentially the idea here is what can we do to get your emotional responses and get you to act emotionally rather than using your rational, logical thought, right? Um, and, and Russians, uh, there is a state-sponsored um, activity going on. Uh, we suspect that it's going on at the moment as well because uh, the researchers have uh, monitoring the social media forums and things like that after uh, these kind of events have noticed that the the trends and uh, and the type of activities that are ongoing are similar to what was happening when the russian uh, state groups were manipulating the online discourse after the uh, black lives matter movement uh, after the george floyd uh, that, uh, after the uh, Ferguson uh, incident. So similarities exist today uh, with, with back then. It, the idea is to, how do I get them to, you know, the Russians are trying to get us to be, to be emotional and divide us, and which goes back to the previous um, point about divide and conquer. It's much easier to do, divide, you know, conquer a uh, divided nation than the than United Nation. Um, that being said, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think the Russians have any, any um, goal of conquering the United States. But what it can do is, A, it can discredit the United States uh, as a country, as a society. And B, uh, it basically ties us up. Uh, into the sort of our domestic problem set and that we are while we are focused on that they can do things they are free to do other things in internationally because we will not be as responsive as what we would have been uh, if, uh, if these things were not happening domestically uh, so for example um, russians are really keen on conducting information warfare and getting their uh, influence into Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Um, most of us in the, uh, in the United States would not, if we go out to the street today and ask them, hey, did you know that the Russians are in the Sub-Saharan Africa trying to do X, Y, and Z? Uh, most people, A, uh, would, not, would not even have any idea that was going on, and B, probably won't care. Um, because we have other things that we have to worry about domestically here in the United States and that most of us have our minds set to. And in the last bullet there is a, is a very good example of what they were able to achieve is they, uh, after Philando Castile's death, they actually set up a Facebook site and organized a protest um, uh, on behalf of, of quote unquote, um, quote unquote, on behalf of, um, you know, the uh, Philando, uh, because, you know, he was wrongfully shot. So, and Black Lives Matters activists were very surprised by this because they did not organize any of these. And all of a sudden these protests sprung up and they're like, oh, what's going on? And they're using our slogans and they're using this protest as, uh, as being organized to use our slogans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what has, what's going on here? And what if I, turns out that it was the Russians. So the, one, the reason that I brought this up on this one is that our adversaries don't really pick a side uh, in terms of, you know, 
do we want to be do we want to portray ourselves as Antifa? Do we want to portray ourselves as a uh, being on the side of George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matters, or do we want to be on the side of the white national, you know, white, white nationalist? They don't really care. Uh, they they actually operate on both sides of the aisle, uh, if you will. And the idea is to what can I do to get people riled up as much as possible is really the question that they that they're going after. So they they don't pick one side or the other, um, and that I think a lot of times we kind of think, oh wait, you know the Russians want to do this because they want to help one side because that would then make make it easier for the Russians to do X. Well, that may be true in certain circumstances, but for most parts they would just go after everyone. Um, the idea is just to sow discontent and confusion. So what does this all mean? You know, I've, I've gone on for about 25 minutes. So what does this all mean? Well, so one of the things that as I have studied information warfare is that information warfare as, you know, as, as indicative of the quotes that I use, this thing has been around for a long, long time. And so it's nothing new as a tactic against our adversaries or our adversary using it against us as a tactic. We've done it, the United States have done many, many disinformation campaigns uh, and information warfare against the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and they've done it against us. So it's nothing new to us and nothing new to anybody else that are, that are in this game. What's really different, I think, is how much exposure we have to this particular form of strategic positioning and also the, you know, the quote-unquote warfare. During the Cold War, when we were doing this against the Soviet Union, and then when the Soviet Union was doing it against us, most of the people did not realize that that was even going on. So life was as, quote, as normal, right? And life went on as normal because unless you were involved in that particular sec segment of society or you know, particular industry that that was targeting, um, you didn't see it. Most people didn't see it. But today, Everybody sees it. And I think that is actually a very, very important difference. You know, I, I, I like to say, talk about, well, things don't, haven't changed that much. Well, in principle, maybe. But what has really changed is how much exposure the information has today in our society, right? Everybody sees every, almost everything that's being put out, which actually makes it much easier for the adversary to use information as a weapon. Um, given, the, given our high, extremely high rate of information propagation today, um, they, you don't have to wait weeks or months to see the results. You can see the results almost instantaneously now and change your tactics or change your strategy based on the reaction of the target. Um, and the other, the other important difference is today I talked about a lot about Russians um, uh, conduction, con conduct of information warfare because they, they have done the most um, among all of our adversaries. Uh, but information environment is no longer a state actor domain. It used to be in order for you to do a real good disinformation campaign, you have to be a state and have to have the state's infrastructure behind you to do all of it because it, it was still, it was less expensive than actually going to war, but it was still, you know, very involved. Uh, whereas today, with our technologies today, anybody can start one. Um, there, there have been research, research uh, there have been research conducted that talked that wanted to talk about well, how can we start a disinformation campaign? How easy is it to start a disinformation campaign on a specific type of platform? And amazingly, it's quite easy today, right? So you don't have to be a state player, or or their proxies to do it. A non-state actor could do it. So, and we see that we see that today when COVID nineteen started. We have had we have had calls for 
uh, people using, we have had people using the, using the social media platform uh, to call for spread of COVID-19 as a weapon uh, that started. And then we have had a lot of disinformation and misinformation that occurred surrounding COVID-19 from various non-state actor groups um, designed to sow confusion into the society about what this disease and what this virus is actually about. So that's a very important difference uh, from before to today. And another one is because of the advancement of technology, we can't necessarily easily identify what is fake or what is the, the part of the disinformation campaign and what is the truth. So this line between truth and fact and many manipulated truth or manipulated information and pro produced information, right? line starts to blur. It's very difficult to see. There's clearly a line, but it's very difficult to see where that line is anymore uh, for, the, for most people that are receiving these type of information. What that really gets to is then it degrades our trust, right? Because I can't trust our news outlet to be pumping out true information. And the news outlet may be doing their due diligence to check their information before they broadcast. But if the production of that information was so good and they cannot figure out that that was fake, then it doesn't matter, right? The news outlet will, will think that it's true and they will, they will broadcast it for us. Well, for us as the consumer, then we start to lose trust in our news outlets. And furthermore, you end up losing trust in your society, in your institutions and your society, and which will then get to, get to the uh, achievement of the goal for the adversary. And eventually, you know, people just become tired of it and they just become indifferent and they just disengage from the entire thing, which is also a good effect if you think about it. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to get us to not care about anything else but ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and uh, you know, have us live in our little bubble. You know, this indifference and disengagement is a good, good outcome as a uh, part of the influence campaign. And so, what do I think about? Uh, I'll end it here with the, uh, you know, what I think about how we could move forward to counter all this problem is that, you know, I think the education is key. And, and you know, coming from an academic, saying that education is key is perhaps uh, sort of very pedestrian. But what I really mean by that is not necessarily education that we get, you know, in, in college classrooms that we talk about, you know, the societal uh, impacts of disinformation, not that kind of thing. What I'm talking about is we need to educate our people, our students, our population to better identify what is true and what is not. You know, when the information has been manipulated, when it has not been. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of education is key is we need to educate them to, uh, we need to educate ourselves to, to get ourselves to be better at identifying when the piece of information we're looking at is false. Um, and whether that's malign or benign doesn't matter. As long as we can identify it as false, then we can flag that and move on. And which then, can talk about things like inoculation against disinformation, right? Um, how can we become more inoculated? It's kind of like having a vaccine for disinformation, if you will, um, that we are able to identify it and we can say, okay, we're not going to be swayed by uh, the, the uh, information that is being pumped out. And, um, and with that, I will uh, end it here and uh, go, to, go over to uh, questions. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much, Steve. So I have uh, one question now. Um, what credible sources can people tune to, turn to when they validate when they want to validate the information coming into their information environments? What organizations and entities have the resources, credibility, and authority to play that role? Um, 
So actually, I uh, when I I don't think uh, we can say that there's a specific source, right? Um, now there are obviously credible sources uh, that uh, that are out there to do uh, to provide us objective information, uh, such as international organizations, uh, the the government papers, uh, but all of those, uh, as you are probably, some of, some of you might be chuckling at that answer, right? Because, well, international organizations have their own agendas. US government has its own agenda. Every government has its own agenda. But the key is this, right? If you know that they have their own agenda, um, you know their biases, so then you can check against that bias as you are looking through those materials. Um, and what I usually tell people is, well, there is actually no single source that you want to say, this is credible and this is not. What you try to do is you try to what we call, you know, what we do as a triangulation approach, right? You get as many sources as you can on the, on a specific topic and see where the con consistencies are. Now, in theory, that should work. In practical sense, one of the challenges of this is then becomes, well, what happens if a lot of these materials are citing each other, right? So it all leads back to one source at the end, which was biased to begin with. My, my answer to that would be, well, by doing triangulation methods and by trying to get as many information, as much information as you can and from different sources, you should be able to figure out that where the original source is coming from. Then you can investigate that original source and to determine whether you think you're going to trust this or you, you're not. Um, so I guess that's a long way of answering. Unfortunately, uh, there may not be a single source that you say, you know, this source is extremely credible for this, per, you know, for whatever uh, information you're looking for. Uh, it, so it, has, it will end up being a, a lot of legwork on our part to determine whether the information we're looking at is true or, or credible. Probably not a very satisfying answer, is it? <laughs> I think it was excellent. <laughs> Because I, I mean, it is a complicated issue, certainly, and it, it'd be nice if there were kind of a magic bullet for it, but it makes sense. I think that was, a, I think that was a very academic answer to that. <laughs> nothing after about five minutes. <laughs> I think that's okay. Um, okay, so this this is a bit of a, a lengthy question, but here we go. Um, social media companies seem to have made concerted effort on information hubs with authoritative sources related to COVID nineteen. However, they seem to struggle to replicate this strategy. Um, with political commentary, elections, and international issues, do they need to work more closely with international organizations and governments to similarly flag breaking news and insurance authenticity? The short version is yes. Um, I think there's, I think there are a lot of challenges only because of what the social media companies, I mean, social media companies are companies, so which means they're, they have to make money somehow, right? And there are, a lot of times there are um, differences in uh, perspective between uh, what the international organizations or the governments would want them to do um, in order to make the situation better um, versus what they are willing to do. Uh, and then there's also a lot of the civil, civil rights and social issues that go along with that um, as soon as government gets involved, right? Any sort of government entity gets involved then we have, uh, we have civil rights issues, et cetera, et cetera, that we need to consider. Um, so, so then what that really means is essentially you are recommending to the companies, hey, here's, here are things that you could do and the companies are free to take it up or not take it up. Um, and then usually what that translates to then is they will take up the one, take up, they'll take up those that they believe are more profitable uh, and then and less legally troubling. Uh, so, you know, COVID-19 
Uh, you've probably seen that, you know, you, I think your point is, you know, they have moved on so quickly on COVID-19, but not on others because, well, COVID-19, everybody can, everyone, meaning all of us, can pretty much agree that we are not going to make this into a most, uh, okay, general population will not make this into a political problem, right? So if, if social media company takes something down about COVID-19 because it's a, it's a wrong information scientifically, then nobody's going to say, hey, you have you know, trampled on my free speech rights. Uh, whereas when it comes to elections, political realm, that water becomes really, really muddy. And where does the free speech stop and you know, the hate speech start? And even that is a very muddy water. And, and that's, I think, what they're trying to really avoid and what the governments are trying to, they are struggling with it as well, is how do we regulate that while not trying to regulate civil rights issues, right? So that's, I think that's really the uh, problem. Uh, but on principle though, yes, uh, working really closely, more closely with international organizations and government organizations uh, would help uh, us, you know, trudge through this muddy water better. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, our next question is, have you come across any mechanism that has been empirically supported to inoculate against dis disinformation? Um, actually, not really. Um, so studies thus far have uh, been very specific to certain populations. Um, so if you're looking for sort of a generic or generalizable um, mechanism, uh, it doesn't really exist as a generalizable mechanism. Uh, and, and I think that's probably going to be true for quite a while, right? Because human beings, and one of my, uh, one of my old professors used to say this, human beings are troubling because you know, they don't do what you expect them to do. And, uh, and modeling human beings are just, you know, it's a nightmare. And that's because we are humans. Um, so given that, and I, and I think he was absolutely correct, in that particular sense. Uh, and given that, I, I'm not sure how much generalizability you can get uh, once you come out of a specific demographic group or social group or what have, or however you want to divide up the, uh, the, the test case that you want to run. Um, so so that's, a, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, another challenge really is um, and this is the area that I'm really interested in and working on at the moment is um, measuring effectiveness and influence of the information campaigns or, or information warfare, right? Um, if you think about, think back to 2016 elections, uh, we talk about how these information campaigns and influence campaigns and disinformation have influenced and affected the outcome of the election. I believe it has, and that is a very true statement, but what we don't know is how much impact did it actually have, right? How, what's the percentage of votes that went one way or the other, or what's the percentage of people that stayed home because of, you know, they felt one way or another um, about what was going on in the election? So the question really becomes, what were the tactics they used and how effective was this thing that they're using? Uh, we, we know it has the effect. That's not the question. The question is how effective was it? Um, and there is no metrics for that either. Uh, and there's actually, we haven't even defined what effectiveness means in this particular domain um, in, in true sense. So, so all of these, your, your question about um, you know, how do we inoculate uh, falls into that category of we need to first define what that means first, and then we can try to figure out how to measure it. Um, so our next question is, uh, why are there no major mechanisms or platforms in place to identify disinformation in the United States? For example, in Taiwan, there's a fact-checking platform. In Sweden, they deliver pamphlets to households with guidelines on how to identify disinformation. What suggestions would you have for a platform that could be easily accessible or digestible to the majority of the U.S. public? Um... So I, I do know that the, there's efforts ongoing um, in various parts of the US government uh, to come up with 
uh, some some guys like you are talking about. Um, thus far, what we have, I think the struggling part is what I said about this being very target specific, right? And um, and at some point, and we've been talking about this, is this, at some point we need to have some sort of generic thing that says, here is what you do. Um, and that has not, uh, yeah, that has not been, uh, that, that has not been made clear uh, yet in the United States at least. Um, and, and why we why do we not have one yet? Um, that I cannot answer actually. But um, but I do know there's efforts on, on ongoing efforts to have one, um, and um, and hopefully we should see one soon. I mean that, that's I mean I know that's not an answer, but that's um, it's best I can do about that one because I do not know why we don't have one yet. Um, sure, that's okay. You don't need to have all the answers, just some of them. Um, our next question is, uh, what precautions or actions, if anything, should a democracy take to protect a population from large scale disinformation, especially when disinformation is exploiting algorithmic based search platforms? I'm going to, I'm going to give you a very, very sort of esoteric answer. Um, actually, I think the best way for a true democracy, uh, or for those of us uh, that are aspiring to be true democracies, uh, the best way to protect our population really is through discourse, right? Um, and through discourse, we can we can figure out where the information was manipulated because. One side or the other will say, well, this is the information that I have. Another side will say, no, 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 that's not the information that we have and then we can work on it together. Now, the challenging part is not necessarily that we have discourse. The challenging part is that we actually have civilized discourse where we actually listen to each other. That's the challenging part, right? Um, because if you look at the uh, social media platforms today, we have plenty of discourse. We just don't listen to each other. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, that's the challenge, I think, is, uh, and it's the best way for the democracies uh, to become stronger and more resilient is to cultivate a culture where we actually sit down and talk to each other and listen to each other. And then we can forge a way ahead rather than going into our corners. And, um, and, and that's perfectly normal for human beings, by the way. Human beings are good at going into their own corners and staying in their corners and only playing with those people that are in that corner. And, and that we, are, we are wired that way. So we are really good at it, which is what these information campaigns are actually exploiting, right? Um, so in a sense, we have to come out of our own comfort zone and go talk to the other side and listen to the other side and what, what they're, where they're coming from, and then we can move ahead from there. And that is, that is truly the way that the democracies are supposed to work. Um, and that is the ideal that we have always strived for. And I think that's the part that we need to recultivate in our society uh, to make that happen. Sure, thank you. Um, so our next question is, uh, what role does conspiracy, what role do conspiracy theories play in the spread of disinformation and division in our society? <laughs> uh, so if I answer this, do I get it's being recorded? Do I get like <laughs> spammed by all the conspiracy theory people? Is it? We'll try to protect you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, conspiracy theories are. Um, what's really interesting about conspiracy theories, right, is that they hang on to now. Large part of the conspiracy is not true, right? But but there are parts of the conspiracy that people go, oh, you know what? I can see how you can link those together and come up with this, right? which, is, which is that basic part about, you know, the disinformation campaign needs to anchor somewhere in the truth that I talked about earlier. So conspiracy theories, uh, I actually don't know how much conspiracy theorists or conspiracy theories play in the, play in current ongoings of the disinformation campaigns or not, 
but they're what they have used to construct cons conspiracy theory um, are actually being used. Uh, it's, it's a very good part of how you can make this information, this information campaign is much better. Um, and so it, it tells you, shows you sort of a recipe of how to make it. Um, and so as far as direct play, I, I don't have information on that. But as far as sort of a theoretical, you know, inspiring others and how you construct this information, certainly they have a very good role um, in doing that. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, in a world dominated by big tech and social media or media biased opinions, what approach would you take to ensure factual understanding of the information environment as it relates to informing the public? I think one of the things that we have been, we as in the, uh, well, I think one of the things that uh, has been lacking uh, and the and government has, um, government has been struggling to keep up, right? So the, and we call it the counter messaging campaign or what have you, um, and trying to put facts out there for people to consume. Um, and what's really interesting about this is the immediate answer that people might go to is, well, you know, the government has to put out a guide or a, uh, a position that says, this is what the truth is, and this is not. Um, but government has its own challenges. Uh, what I mean by that is we have a healthy dose of skepticism about our own government and any other government for that matter. Uh, especially in the United States and probably in most of the free world. Um, so government has its own challenges about that. What that means is how do, you know, government may not be the best outlet to tell us who, who has the final say in the truth, right? Um, so what that would mean then is the organizations or the entities that we may have to rely on are nonprofit organizations uh, that whose goal is to propagate and inform the public about what the truth is. Um, and it comes with its own challenges, obviously, uh, but it may have the ability to overcome some of the challenges that the government has. Um, and and I think really what I'm trying to sort of trying to dance around the real answer really is that I, th I think the real solution is up to us, um, up to the, up to the citizens and up to the, uh, up to the uh, nonprofits uh, to, for those of us who want to be in that world uh, to, you know, vanguard the, uh, the truth of information. And um, which is not a satisfying answer, I, I understand. Uh, but because the issue is no matter who takes up, and, and this is probably why it's so difficult to combat uh, disinformation campaigns or influence campaigns, is that you know countering that information, no matter what you who you are, um, people will look at you with a certain lens, and. And that is a challenge uh, as a counter side of the uh, equation. And so what that means is it's really up to us to de decide um, when and where, how, how we want to do this. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our next question is, do you think there's a need to formulate a mechanism to make social media giants responsible for circulation of misinformation? Um, I think we have come a long way um, from just five years ago in doing that. We have still a long way to go. Um, but the, at the end of the day, um, 
I think we do. I think we do in, in, a, in a way. Um, yes, there's all, all, all sorts of questions about how do we make it, uh, how do we make it so that the, uh, it's not impinging too much on, infringing too much on the, uh, the government's uh, or the company's um, rights, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the, you know, we've come a long way and I think we have, uh, I think, I don't know if we're on the right path, but at least we're on some sort of path, uh, which we weren't before. Um, so, but yeah, we do, we do need to have a, uh, a mechanism to do that, a, a better policy uh, to make that happen. Um, so our next question is, uh, assuming that an international organization like the UN will eventually hold an inquiry into transparency, into transparency and or the lack of sharing information on COVID-19, what effect would such a process have ultimately on disinformation? Would that be one of the vaccines that we speak of against dis disinformation? I think, yeah, I think it could be. Um, the, although, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic. I, I think, uh, I, I think it could be uh, definitely a way to do that. Um, the, and one of the things that we have not, and, and, and that will be a very welcome change in, in a way, in that, you know, for, at the moment, disinformation campaigns are essentially, you don't get, um, there is no, there's no downside, right? Uh, if you are the actor that is conducting the disinformation campaign, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You're certainly not going to get arrested uh, for most of these things, um, or chastised in the international stage. You know, nobody is calling out one country or another, saying, "Hey, you have conducted this kind of disinformation campaign, so we're going to sanction you," et cetera, et cetera. That's not happening. Um, so both state actors and non-state actors are free to act as they desire at the moment. That's the sort of the rule of the game, which makes it much more difficult to handle. Um, so given that if something like a UN inquiry happens, it could, it would be a start for states to think twice about, well, do we want to do this? Do we want to go down this road? What is our consequence if we go down this road? Because right now that, that equation is kind of like, well, there's almost no consequence if we go down this road. Um, so that will be a very good way to start moving in the right direction. Um, not to say that, you know, the, the way that the United Nations is designed, not to say that a lot of the countries will just do it anyway, because the United Nations may or may not do anything about it. Um, but at least there is a consequence there. Uh, which we don't have now. Sure. Um, I will note that it is new now. Uh, Steve, we have a couple more questions. Steve, are you able to stick around with us for a little bit longer? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, if anybody needs to go right now, you're welcome to. Um, I will have the recording available by the end of the day. You will be able to find a link to it on our events page uh, in case you have to duck out right now. But, um, so I'm looking at where, lost my place on where the questions are, but here, okay, I have it. Um, given the overload of information out there, both true and false, it can be difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. Have you found any patterns of successful disinformation, like if they have X number of bots, if an influencer retweets it? Um, how does certain disinformation make it through and others die? And what are the factors that influence uh, disinformation and making it through to the mainstream? Um, so, if you're talking about, so in today's world, yeah, you talked about bots and things. So, so I think we're talking about sort of in the, on the cyber domain. Um, but even with, with or without the cyber domain, the, I think the most important ones uh, is the, the ecosystem that the disinformation campaign creates, right? How successful is it to create an ecosystem? And if it's not, then it, you usually tend to die. Um, so the six, at the rate and the, the rate and the effectiveness in terms of creating an ecosystem and an echo chamber, um, 
for the information is has usually been sort of that determining determining at least from the symptomatic side, right? Because that's that's what's observable, right? What's observable is hey, this information campaign seems to be successful, and if you observe that, then it looks like well, look, here's the here's the ecosystem that they have created to do that, and that ecosystem was more successful. Okay, well, so that's what's observable. Um, so from that perspective, so the ecosystem that is being created is very important. So if you can't create the ecosystem, then it tends to go away. And the and how you algorithmically do that, or you use you do you use bots? Do you use people? Um, what's been very what has been more successful is actually the mixture between bots and people, right? So it's not just bots talking to each other. It's the bots talking to people and making people talk to other people. And that's, that's how the, uh, that, that has been the more successful ones that I've, that I've come across at least. Sure. Um, our next question is, uh, what roles do measures of performance and measures of effectiveness um, how could they be developed to identify threats to the information environment? So, um, at least at least the way I envision it, right, is that um, we have the idea really becomes if you have measures of effectiveness or measures of impact, and you know certain a certain campaign had a high impact, let's say, let's just go with high, medium, low, because that's what I have in my head right now. But the, um, so it had a high impact. Then you can trace back to, well, what were the strategies and tactics and techniques that the, this particular information campaign used uh, to achieve that high impact against that target, right? Um, the idea then becomes eventually, if you collect enough information on that, then you can somewhat come up with a trend that says, look, on this type of, on, on this particular type of issue set, targeting these types of demographics, this is the tactics that's most important, most uh, impactful or effective, which means if the bad guy knows that, then they will probably try to use that. And, and then instead of trying to look, think about it this way, if you're a defender, and then this is from a defender's perspective, right? So if you're a defender, instead of defending the entire frontage, you can now selectively defend, ah, that particular tactic is used for this kind of targeting and this type of issue. So I will defend against that particular target or that particular threat, right? But we don't right now, we don't even know what to protect against. So we, what we're doing is we're basically building, we're trying to build a big wall that's, that that um, that basically protects the entire segment, which, if you really think about it, that in those terms, it's the same thing that the cybersecurity folks have which issues with. Is well, how do you protect against everything? If you're if everything is priority to protect and nothing is priority, then then you you end up falling, right? So how do I make it so that we can modularize our defense and the the impact measures and effective measures can lead us to that by identifying what are the tactics that is most successful in terms of impact and effectiveness. That's at least the way I'm envisioning it. Thank you. Um, so how do we safely talk about disinformation ops so as to not exaggerate their, inf their influence and exacerbate the problem by ultimately providing a larger platform for the perpetrator by talking about the operation too much? I'm not sure if we, well, I'm not sure if we can, I, I don't think we give the perpetrator any more credibility by talking about the, the disinformation campaigns and what is going on in terms of disinformation in the information environment um, by talking about them. We certainly don't want to propagate their message, uh, but I think 
the way to do it is we talk about what is going on and this is disinformation and we can talk about the disinformation itself, not necessarily propagate the message, if that makes sense, right? Um, because I don't think not talking about it is the way. Because then it's just like, well, we're going to stick our head in the sand and we're gonna, we're, it's not going to happen. Um, so I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution is talk about it, but talk about it in a way that we don't actually propagate the message. So we are going to talk about this information, what people are doing in terms of disinformation, how they're using it. And we can research about those and we can talk about those. Um, but we don't have to do that and propagate at the same time. Sure. Um, and this is our final question, unless anyone is typing furiously. Um, you're welcome to, to send any other questions our way. Um, but what are your thoughts on governments trying to discredit real information as conspiracy, conspiracy theories? How can this issue be resolved? Um, can you say that again? Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on governments trying to discredit real information as conspiracy theories? How can this issue be, be resolved? Uh, so I, I think that comes back to, um, and the and United States to a certain extent has had a very robust um, way of doing it. Is that and I think that comes back to uh, citizen groups uh, and the. Um, and nonprofit groups and civic groups that has had traditionally a long-standing uh, role of the role of um, the check fact checking um, the government uh, or any other information that is out there. Um, and we've had a, a very long tradition of doing that. And, uh, and I think and that's one way to check the government on, on information that they're putting out as well, right? Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's our best solution at the moment. Um, well, that's all the questions that I've gotten in the chat so far. Um, Steve, thank you so much for speaking with us today. No problem. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you liked this event, then you are welcome to go to the, our events link um, and check out any of our other events that we have. Uh, I might particularly draw attention uh, to our uh, the GTD, the Global Terrorism Database, is going to be releasing its latest information soon. Um, and the GTD Program Manager, Aaron Miller, will be doing an event discussing the latest trends in terrorism, uh, the latest trends in terrorism um, on, uh, ooh, ooh, I should know this, ooh, uh, July 9th. Um, so you're welcome to sign up for that. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day.